Podría sacó que vos calmara. So we are ready to start. Today we have a, a potential member of KIM, <laughs> always, Christos Ephimiopoulos. There is no need for any special introduction. He's going to speak about a subject that uh, it is uh, very, let's say, uh, philosophic. philosophic now and on uh, an issue and a subject that it takes uh, uh, a lot of space in uh, our research center the last years, I would say. You see already the title on the screen, the information approach to the interpretation of quantum mechanics. So, Christos. <laughs> Let's, let's go. Okay, thank you, Pano. It's always a very great pleasure to return kind of home, let's say. Uh, well, I, I want to start with a bit of, I don't know how to move that. Should I? Okay. Okay. So to describe a bit the motivation, which is uh, the fact that I noticed with great pleasure that there is a reopening nowadays of the ontological discussion, the discussion about the ontological structure of quantum mechanics at KIM, and in particular with the work, recent works of uh, Yanis that developed a kind of, uh, let's say, interpretation or beginning of an interpretation uh, of what quantum experiments are supposed to be and how can this all be reconciled, for example, with the two-slit experiment and so on. And uh, I state here in particular that sentence that uh, you, you clearly see that, that there, is a, there is a world of people that uh, just emphasize the, on, the ontic, as we will see, aspect. But okay, I will let this open a bit, uh, uh, which is uh, that we, this is the sentence, and several others before us, haven't lost hope that the particles are indeed independent individual particles. So let's say all these efforts to describe the fundamental laws of equations of motion and laws of motion by just the, more or less the things which we know from classical mechanics. Okay. Uh, so I will start with a question which is very old, actually probably it just goes back to the Solvay conference, let's say the foundations of quantum mechanics, but actually has been reviewed very nicely in a, in a paper by these people in 2010, which sets the terminology, so to speak. I mean, is the nature of the wave function ontic or epistemic? And now I will slightly paraphrase that. And I will, I will ask instead, are the laws of physics altogether? ontic or epistemic. And uh, I would like to try to motivate a bit what those words mean at the beginning and how all this is connected in the end to the... The ontic is ontological. Probably. We will see what, I mean, this term has been used by several people and established somehow, but I will give a definition and then you will judge by yourself if that actually means exactly ontological or whatever. So now, just to do that, the laws of physics are ontic means simply that the laws of physics speak about what there is, okay? So there are, let's say, there are particles and there are fields and the particles have positions and they have momenta and they have energy. So you just start speaking what's the stuff and what are the quantities which characterize that stuff altogether. While when you say the laws of physics are epistemic, now this is more subtle, but actually very interesting, I would say. The laws of physics do not speak about what there is, but about how we deal with the information that we, the observers, have on what there is, okay? And now, you, already from the start, we have to make the, the basic disclaimer that this is certainly not a denial of realism. I mean, you don't say, you don't question the existence of a physical reality here, 
something. We certainly, I mean, all physicists, if you are a professional physicist, you have to, by definition, to accept the existence of a physical reality. Uh, what we say here is instead that between the reality and the observer, there are things happening, there are interfaces. So the laws which we write down are, are, are partly due to what there is and partly due to the way and to the access we have and the way we understand what it means to have information on what there is. So they are partly reflect our own structure of whom now. Well, that's interesting. We are their observers, I mean, conscious observers. You know very well that Everett in his PhD tried to construct a theory in which we have registers, let's say, machines. That, so these machines might continue to exist when there will be no more mankind on planet Earth or maybe in any other type of extraterrestrial, let's say, intellectual entity. But uh, nevertheless, registers themselves reflect a certain construction. I mean, what do they register? Typically, these are counts. Counts of what? I mean, you need to dress them with some conceptual framework. So the, the concept of observer, what the observer does, how the observer functions is very, very dominant, even if, when we try to get rid of the observer, but just making everything look very objective through the existence of some machines that are not ourselves, let's say, the final recipients of the information. And here I would like to emphasize also the role of the, the world information. And uh, this, this sentence, as far as I can say, is due to Dimos Kazan, as if I recall well, I probably, he has repeated that to, I mean, in personal uh, communication several times, that the information content of a theory is probably the key to understand gravity itself. So in, let's say in a very, loose way of rephrasing that information gravity. It's not the matter or the energy, it's not the stuff. What does it yeah. mean, gravitate? Well, produces, it is what we use. I mean, literally speaking, it means that if you want to make a, even a semi-classical theory of gravity, let's say, to put it technically, in the, in the right-hand side of Einstein's equations, you should put, let's say, the energy, let's say, the, the stress tensor, as you put the matter, stuff, but this in quantum mechanics is just the wave function. So speaking about that, you have a, that the metric is the space time is affected essentially by the, the way the matter field, so to speak. I mean, this is the semi-classical. We don't know what is the theory of gravity, but it's just a concept. So if you accept now that all these matter fields or wave functions or anything you want to call them are themselves the ones that put the right hand side of the, of the equations of gravity, then might maybe the, the, the source of everything is just those terms. So gravity is a direct consequence of that. Anyway, we will come back to what information means because that's, but now I have an exercise that I will let, if you don't have anything interesting to do in your vacation time, which is the model of Yanis, is it, according to the definitions that, which we gave, is it ontic or is it epistemic? And just to mention very quickly, of course, you have to probably find and read the papers, uh, that, but roughly, I mean, the way I understand it from some preprints that he has sent to me is that particles are still particles. I mean, dominate the, by trajectories, which may be not very different from the classical trajectories and so on. But the detectors register uh, particles according to a strange law, so to speak. Then there is a phase that is carried with the particles and this phase has to be added in some way. So in order to build a histogram in the end, so the statistics here enters essentially by the fact that the observation is in the end is a histogram, a statistic, but this, the buildup of the histogram is very much de depends strongly on this, let's say, phase. This is roughly speaking the model. Well, I will not say anything about that question. I mean, I just try to explain the motivation. I will let you think on that. But uh, since we promised that it's gonna be a, kind of philosophical talk today, 
let us mention that, of course, this, those questions are way older than quantum mechanics itself. And probably starting with Plato, I mean, there is a, a physical, let's say, context in which one could understand even the, the world of ideas of Plato somehow. And this, in my opinion, is not very different from what we arrived to summarize as, let's say, a statement by Galileo, which is that the book of nature is written in the language of mathematics. Let's say that the natural philosophy or physics let's say, is, is written in this book, which is continuously open in front of our eyes, but uh, we can only read it when we know the language, when we know the the letters uh, in which it is written. And this is written in mathematics. And it's interesting to say that this mathematics, though, is not exactly what we will see below, because he speaks about triangles and circles and so on, so geometry. So let us make this little distinction here, because geometry is actually speaking well, if you ask uh, probably the modern definition would be speaking about objects or relational, let's say, constructs among objects without coordinates, without numbers. Say, take Euclidean geometry. Say, how do you define two triangles are equal? How do you prove the theorems of geometry? The ones we did at school, okay? So you don't need coordinates. You don't do it with analytical geometry like we did, we were doing in the last year of high school in my time. I mean, you do it with properly with sentences that relate the elements, the objects themselves, but no numbers. But we will see that in physics, there is a bit of difference with that, let's say the geometric at least interpretation. But anyway, we keep the fact that the, the main statement here is that the fundamental ontology, so to speak, are the mathematical laws. I mean, when you speak about what there is, the first thing that probably there is are the laws themselves, which should be written in a mathematical language. Okay, so there is a bit of flavor, ontological flavor of this type in that sentence. Uh, and Einstein actually is quite interesting. Try to put this in a, in a more, let's say, well-defined context. We'll, we'll try to speak a bit about that. But as you can understand, it's fundamentally different instead of what we say in the epistemic approach. Say, because in the epistemic approach, we don't have, let's say, a fundamental ontology of which we can be aware. I mean, all we are are information processes themselves, okay? So you, you already see some elements of that difference well before the development of, of quantum mechanics. And now just to, to, to be a bit more concrete on what Einstein, well, well, this probably comes from this very, you know, influential paper of Einstein, Podolsky and Rosen, which tries to say, I mean, starts and develops a whole introduction of the paper about what physical theory means. What is physics about? Let's say, well, how, in particular, what, how can we speak about the completeness of the physical theory? How will we call it is complete? It's a complete description of reality. What should be the aim in that sense? So now Einstein is quite careful in that and actually he goes on, uh, well, you can see this is the very first sentences. Let's say any serious consideration of physical theory must take into account the distinction between the objective reality, which is independent of the theory and the physical concepts with which the theory operates. These concepts are intended to correspond with the reality. By means of these concepts, we picture this reality to ourselves. So essentially, what Stein tells you here is that physics is a mapping, essentially, between the elements of the physical reality, the elements of the physical reality, and the concepts to which we map the elements of the physical reality. And then we work on with those concepts, let's say, doing mathematics, essentially. This is the, this is the description, roughly speaking. And then there are many other things about 
completeness, the fact that quantum mechanics may not be complete and so on. But at this point, I'm not interested so much, so far, so much, let's say, in the EPR paradox, but just on the very beginning of the story, which is the way that Einstein tries to define what the physical theory is, what physics is. I would say in that respect, this is a rather ontic interpretation. You can say there are, there is, the, the physical theory certainly is about what there is. So you have to figure out, say, quantities by which you will describe what there is. You have to say the, there are particles and the particles have charge, they have mass, they have position, they have momentum, they have, you have to set up some quantities for that. And your description will be the closest to completion, the closest, let's say, the better is the mapping between what you perceive as the elements of the physical theory and their correspondence to the elements of the, of the physical world. Okay. But now, in 1964, as you know very well, there was the, the famous Bell's theorem. And uh, Bell's theorem is probably, well, there are the opinions differ on what actually it's in the importance in physics I will show you afterwards. But let's say in, in, a, in a rough reading, you can say that essentially what Bell's theorem tells you is that you can find the cases of quantum systems, you need entanglement for that, but that's okay. In which if you just assume, okay, that there are some quantities, let's say the spin, okay? You can, of course, you can construct versions also for the position or any other quantity, which you imagine. That these quantities are the labels of the physical reality, let's say, for this system. And they have some value. Discrete, continuous, well, we don't care at that point. Okay. So then you say, come on, if I, measure, let's say I know from quantum mechanics one at the university that if I measure the position of the particle, I can no longer measure the momentum or maybe there's so there is no meaning made. Or if I measure the Z component of the spin, I cannot measure the X component of the spin at the same time. So, but that's a bit different because what the assumption is here Say, I don't say if you assume that you are able to specify which are the values. Maybe we do all accept happily that there would never be any possibility now or in the future to construct any kind of measuring device that would be able to define simultaneously the values of, let's say, observables which do not commute. Okay. But Nevertheless, okay, notwithstanding our inability to measure them, they do have some value of which we can only speak in a probabilistic way. We can define, we say, the probability that the momentum be such is this one, probability that the position be such. But yet, there is the world to be there. So I know the probability, but I assume that out of all the possible outcomes, the electron has one. That's the only assumption that you need to demonstrate that this is inconsistent with quantum mechanics. So Bell's theorem tells you that if you assume that, you assume there are labels, nothing more, you lead, you are led to inconsistencies with quantum mechanics. In particular, you get out of this assumption you get conditional probabilities. I mean, there are consequences. And these conditional probabilities are at variance with what we find from the so-called correlation estimates, which are probabilities in quantum mechanics. So Bell's theorem tells you that questions your, the mapping essentially that Einstein proposed, I mean, tells you for every element of the physical reality, there is a corresponding, I mean, I try, I mean, what, I, what is it? This is mathematical. And so it has a value. No, it says, yeah. if you do accept that as the basis of science, you will probably be led to inconsistencies with quantum mechanics. And you know that there are the experiments of Alain Aspect starting 
and then loophole free because all these experiments were were not perfect let's say in their implementation up to just a few years ago in which now we have loophole free experiments claiming that indeed let's say bell's theorem as far as we can say is correct and not only there are inconsistent but actually the result which we get out of these experiments is exactly what quantum mechanics tells you okay so now of course in the so christo yes. yes. quick question when you measure the two particles once don't they have a spin don't you measure a spin once uh, if you measure one of them well, then... well, both of them once you, you measure yeah. don't they have a specific spin when you measure when we, exactly i will come to that i mean this will bring us essentially to a, to a very old concept let's say discussed already by jordan uh, and others once, once don't they have a spin exactly that's what i'm telling you that okay. the, actually the assignment of the value I mean, this is, a, this is a theory, and I will show you a, a transparency of that, that the assignment of the value comes at the moment of the measurement, that the measuring apparatus generates the value, not vice versa. It doesn't measure it, it creates it. This is, this is the alternative. And that was very seriously discussed by, by Born and many others, I would say, most of the orthodox thinkers of quantum mechanics would be, would be in agreement with that. Okay, but let's, I will come to that. Actually, there is a transparency of that. But just to mention that this problematic is not new, was already there I mean, at the, be from the beginning. You know, this kind of thought you can see in Dirac and Dirac, I, okay, apart from the fact that the, the book of Dirac, the principles of quantum mechanics is certainly a masterpiece, I guess, I know one person in KM that has read it all and reproduced all the cal calculus, and this person is Costis. Uh, but uh, I hope Costis will agree that it's a masterpiece. I mean, in, in the, the language and the, the deepness of the, of, the, of the thought that there is in there. And now look how it starts. The, the, the introduction to the first edition, if I if I am correct, that uh, well we start with physics, classical tradition, association of observable objects, particles, fluids, fields, elements of physical reality, moving about according to definite laws of force and so on. It has become increasingly evident in recent times, however, that nature works on a different plan. Her fundamental laws do not govern the world as it appears in our mental picture in any very direct way. So just questioning our mental altogether ability to understand the substratum of the laws of nature. Uh, sorry, yeah. Uh, what was that? Okay. So it says her fundamental laws in any, do not govern the world as it appears on mental picture of any direct way, but instead they control a substratum of which we cannot form a mental picture without introducing irrelevances. I mean, it's a direct statement of not of a, of our, of let's say the, the inadequacy of quantum mechanics, probably of any, any that quantum mechanics, what quantum mechanics suggests here is that there will never be any possibility to create a mental picture, which is, does not introduce irrelevances. Well, of course we have to understand what this irrelevance is speaking about. And then he speaks about the formulations of these laws requires the use of the mathematics of transformations. That means operators transformations. I will come to that in a while. So you can see that already at the beginning, that's just one year after Schrodinger's equation, you have Dirac making such claims. And if you want to know a bit more about that, let's say, and I recommend, I highly recommend if you haven't yet read it, a fantastic article by Mermin, 
which was published in uh, Physics Today three years, I mean, essentially analyzing the experiments of, of Aspe. And uh, Mermin says, well, the title is, is the moon there when nobody looks? And actually this is a question that uh, Einstein was supposed to, to pose uh, in, a, in, a, in a walk discussion maybe with, with uh, Bohr, I don't recall anyway, who was the person that was speaking with Einstein. But here is the sentence that I was claiming before to Yanis, let's say the observations not only disturb what has to be measured, but they produce it. This is the opinion of Pasquale Jordan, you see. We compel to assume the electron, the particle, let's say, to assume a definite position, but we ourselves produce the results of measurements. Say the measurement happens when you look at it in a certain way, when the conscious observer, the being, or whatever physical system you want to call an observer, claimed that the value of the spin was this much or that much, the position and so on. Uh, well, there are, I will not read you the whole text, of course, uh, but it's, a, it's about that conversation that Einstein didn't like. He wanted things out there to have properties, whether or not they were measured. And uh, there was this discussion. We often discuss the notions of objective reality. I believe I told you it's with Bohr, probably. I recall that during one walk, Einstein suddenly stopped, turned to me and asked whether I really believe that the moon exists when nobody looks at it. Okay. So if I don't see it, but then, well, here, uh, I had unfortunately no time to prepare a video, but I can tell you this, we, you know, the persons able probably to answer better that question are astronomers for, for, for a very weird reason that you may not believe. Every observational astronomer, Panos probably has some experience, although you are not an observer, but you have certainly observed galaxies with Aristarchus. And we know that, let's say, there is a photon build up of the picture. So you start the picture, I mean, you collect the photons one by one. If you make a very short exposure, you just get a fuzzy thing. I mean, you have one picture, another photon, another photon, and so on. So we have the build up, essentially, of a histogram. What you call a picture is nothing more than how many photons there are at that pixel and how many photons there are in the other pixel. And by the way, the human eye does precisely the same. So let's say if the human eye had sensitivity only at the quantum level, which we don't consider that because we can process many photons in a, in a small unit of time. But assume, for example, that the human eye, which is just a quantitative matter, was only able to process one photon per second, okay? Or few photons per second. And then you, you look at the moon, but then you don't see the moon. You just see scintillations. You don't see, you can imagine, you don't see, uh, let's say, a, a, an orbit. There are no Keplerian orbits. There is no law of Newton. There are no Keplerian ellipses. There, are, there is a point here, another point there, another one. Where is the trajectory? I mean, just try to imagine that if quantum mechanics is correct, and you can certainly produce a video of that, you can reduce the sensitivity to just go with filter a CCD camera and imagine, create a video of how the moon would look to an observer that would be not good enough to collect many photons per unit of time, but just a few photons per unit of time. So one thing which should be very clear here is that we don't speak about the laws of physics only in the ato at the atomic, let's say, level, because the level of a small. But the way we perceive reality, we could perceive reality even for the, for the big, even for galaxies. I mean, when you look to these deep field pictures that are, there were one of them published two days ago, one day ago by James Webb Telescope, how would they be like if the photons were to be collected one by one, let's say? Okay, uh, so 
to, re to, to restore the story of that one, returning to Bell's theorem then. Let's say we, we are always speaking, I recall to you about the questioning of the objective ability of conscious observers to assign values to the elements of physical reality according to a certain correspondence with magnitudes that will be called, called the elements of the physical theory. This is all we discuss. And uh, if we accept Bell's theorem that this is wrong, essentially, you do not do that. It makes no, no, no sense to do that. Then uh, if we accept that, as many people do, we should probably call Bell's theorem one of the most important single work perhaps in the history of physics or the most profound discovery of science. But of course, there are people who disagree with that. So you, you still have a world out there that will tell you that the only part of the art of Bell's work, which is interesting, is the phrase that the definition of reality could be expected uh, to, no reasonable definition of reality could be expected to permit this, which so pointedly summarizes Einstein views of quantum mechanics in the later years. So essentially the point of view that the problem is not with the, what the physical laws are about, but only about quantum mechanics itself, which somehow is an incomplete theory. Okay. And so now we can, in view of all of that, we can, uh, summarize, because that's a long, if you like, introduction to what's the information approach eventually to quantum mechanics. And probably we should start with a precursor of that approach, which was a statistical approach to quantum mechanics. And many people by that usually assume uh, the interpretation given by Einstein himself, uh, themse uh, himself, let's say, that the, that the, uh, let's say that, the, the, that quantum mechanics is only a theory applicable to ensembles, so, but that's not what is the statistical interpretation of quantum mechanics. The statistical interpretation of quantum mechanics was probably made uh, given a form of a, of, a, of a sequence of statements by a, a very influential article by Leslie Ballantyne in 1970. And then there is a, a book also written by Ballantyne, Quantum Mechanics, uh, which is highly recommendable because even if you do not accept the final statements, at least there is a deep and very exhaustive, let's say, discussion of the arguments that allow you somehow to get into the, into the structure of this theory. So now it starts with something there are many statements in there, but I will, I will focus on one, which in my opinion is the most interesting here, which is the fact that physical experiments are always statistical. This applies, as we said, not only to quantum mechanics, but also to classical physics. I mean, physical experiments, even when it concerns pointing out where the moon is, uh, just imply in the end, the building of a histogram. And that's always so. And that refers, as we said, to the moon, that refers to a galaxy, that refers to a human eye. So we, the laws of physics in that approach will have classical quantum, whatever, will have to be statistical. I mean, we speak about the statistics. Uh, now you can say, okay, we do understand the relation with uh, information theory, because information with probability are concerned, but actually Ballantyne was opposed to that idea. So we'll come to that in one second. But before that, let us say, okay, statistics about what? Isn't it about the magnitudes, the observables? I mean, isn't, isn't it about, let's say, the probability that the particle be at that position or this position or whatever. But then we will, will come out to what Yanis was asking before. And what does it mean it is in that position? And okay, the, the short answer to that would have been, okay, I have the screen and uh, the particle go, went through and left a dot. So there is a click somewhere and that click measures the position. So 
in that sense, it would be the, let's say, the, the statistics of those measurements. But actually, in the information approach, you do that. Of course, you do that. But you, you reverse the argument altogether. I mean, you deny the fact that a measuring apparatus is there to measure the position. What you say instead is that there are a, an equivalent class of macroscopic devices, boxes. There is a box here, a set of boxes that we use in the laboratories on planet Earth, another one that people use on another planet, maybe, whatever, that all these boxes uh, form an equivalent class in the sense that if I make the same single particle experiment to begin with, okay, so it was just, uh, it's a mental experiment in a certain way. I mean, I, I produce just one instance and I say, if I put that box in front of the particle, the, the, there, are, there are, if you like, leads count numbered, one, two, three. So, the particle will be measured at position number three. And if I had put the other box, it would again be number three for that one single event, the same, okay? And if I had a third one, it would be the same. So I collect from all the universe, you can imagine all those boxes which somebody can construct, which have the property that they are labeled, they have labeled positions, and one, two, three, and then when I send a particle in there, one and unique time in the history of the universe, that particle would always make switch the lead number three. Okay, so the claim is that the equivalence class of all these boxes is what we will call position. Mm -hmm. So the yeah. It's the same uh, as having many persons as observers? Not exactly, but it is a very interesting question. Here we assume that we just collect all possible devices which however have to measure the same unique event. Of course it's impossible to happen in reality, okay? So the, the I mean, the claim here, and that's very, very, very strong, let's say, in, in people doing quantum information theories, is that the position essentially is my device that defines it. I mean, it's, it's just, it's not apparatus independent, spin measure. Well, this we understand simpler because there are just two states, two legs, up and down, okay? However, the concept is always the same. So now, uh, uh, this can be given a formal, this is from the book of, of, from the article of Ballantyne, this can be given a formal statement. I mean, this, this thing that I told you with words in, in quantum information theory is that an observable is actually uh, an operator. Well, this we knew already from the time of quantum mechanics in which essentially what we do, we take project, we take, we take projectors, we take, let's say in the, in the representation of the, of the, of the, of the magnet itself, we take the matrices, which have all elements equal to zero and one of the diagonal elements equal to one, technically speaking, and you assign to them labels. So you say this projector reflects lead number one, and it will we'll put to it an eigenvalue, we call it, I mean, we'll, number one. And number two, number three, I say which are the labels. And this immediately defines a physical magnitude, essentially. So that's all. So now you, you went and we moved to the other end of the story. I and mean, we just got ourselves completely out of the conversation of what does it mean where the particle is? No, it means what was the lead of the detector which switched on. And then we deprive, we, just get rid of any other need to give any further interpretation to that. Okay, and uh, well, the fundamental, this is the fundamental, let's say, uh, observable definition. And then you have a definition, well, we don't see well here, but maybe if I do this, 
that you need also a basic quantity which generates probabilities. So you have the observables and the probabilities. And this quantity is no longer the wave function, but it is the quantity called density operator. And this density operator works on the pure, if you like, quantum level of quantum superposition, but it can also work with classical quantities. Let's say if, you, if I have a bag of particles, 100 particles with spin one half, and another uh, bag of particles with spin minus one half that do not communicate with each other, they don't see each other, they don't understand anything, okay? This can still allow me in this theory to get a density operator that describes this set. And this set has classical probabilities. There's nothing quantum in it. I mean, there are 50% uh, of the particles are red and 50% of the particles are blue and that's it. And there is nothing quantum in that. So this can be described by, a, again, by a density operator, which is called a mixture or mixed state, if you like. Let me interject for a second here. Uh, uh, yeah. Christo, Dimos Kazanas here. Yeah, you yeah. cannot have a bag of particles, 100 particles, spin, uh, 100 particles spin one half. How do you know? You have to measure the spin first. Yeah, okay, but... So that, uh, that's a, uh, this is a, in violation of what we believe is quantum mechanics. Okay, I can put it in this way. Uh, I can create in the following, actually, it, the way you, you create it is, is this one. You take, let's say, a usual spin device, measuring device, okay? And uh, you send, uh, uh, let's say, a beam. Yes. And uh, separate. after the measurement, after... Gerlach, yes. You have, now you can separate. That's okay. Fine. So then I, what I do is that I enclose this process into another box so I don't see it any longer. Okay. And I just collect the final beam. Okay. And this beam has a statistics. This yes, is exactly the statistics I'm speaking okay. about. Okay. So right. typically you see it in thermal, this kind of devices are what we call the thermal devices. Let's say a thermal, a thermal electron gun, a thermionic emission. Okay. Fine. Okay, this is the All process. Right. Okay. So now, okay, but there is an element of reality in what Vimos just said, in, but there is a very strange properties of these sets, which is that although we tend to understand mixtures, so in this way, we say a bag of particles which are red and a bag of particles which are blue, then you can Imagine a completely different procedure that creates a bag of particles which are green, which is a superposition of red and blue, and another one which are, I don't know, yellow, again, a superposition. And these two, which are now a different, let's say classically speaking, different collection of particles, in quantum mechanics are given by the same, absolutely the same density matrix. And uh, I will come to this point. It means that essentially this interpretation, when we just interpret all the probabilities like mixtures, let's say of this with this, I mean, in quantum mechanics is not true. Quantum mechanics tells you that there are infinitely many combinations which will give you the same density operator. And actually, that means they will give you the same mean values of all the observables. So there will be no way, no experiment by which you can really distinguish between those two things. Okay, so now, uh, well, this we said. Uh, okay, I will skip these details because we're getting a bit late. So just to give a bit of mathematics here, I don't want to give much. Let's say the density operator is just the equivalent of what in classical mechanics we will speak the UV density. So in the same way you have a UV density out of which you can produce not only the mean moments, but actually the moments, any moment of the distribution of any observable, which actually by a theorem of statistics tells you that by the knowledge of all the moments, you actually do know the statistics itself. 
so you have a quantity which is completely analogous to that. This is the density operator and it works in the same way. So it can produce all the moments of the distribution acting on this O hat, which is an observable, which is just the definition we gave before, is these matrices, which are the eigenvalue times the projector sum. So now you see the theory becomes completely abstract in this way. There's a near loss of contact with, let's say, reality. And so pure states are connected to wave functions with this simple formula, while mixtures are connected, are, co are classical statistical combinations of of, of states of this type. Okay, I don't need to speak about the partial trace, but I need probably to speak about the indistinguishability. So, so what I said before is that imagine you have, so the density matrix, you have a two, two a qubit system, let's say two state system, A and B, and you say, I have P1 particles percentage, classical percentage now, in the state A, which do not communicate, were produced with the process we just described before, with P2 percentage of particles of this. So I have a statistical collection of that. And then you can say, no, it was in fact, it was another statistical combination with the percentages P1 capital, P2 capital of the particles being in the state C and in the state D, uh, where these are just quantum states, then the claim is that you can find combinations of all these numbers, you can find combinations of these states and combinations of these probabilities for which the two density matrices which you will get are identical. And this actually means now that since we speak about the same density matrix, all the moments of all the observables that will come out of it will just be equal. And so there will be no physical, we accepted that all physical experiments are statistical. There will be no experiment which you can imagine that will really tell you, do I have this collection or do I have that collection? And so the question of which it is precisely becomes irrelevant. And there is a, a very nice example of that, uh, that I will mention is probably the last thing I want to tell you for today. Uh, in the book of Ballantyne, in which Ballantyne discusses uh, uh, an example that has been, it seems it has been a long story of conversation in a, in a conference, in an actual conference of electron microscopy. And the question is, how do I model the electrons that come out of the, of the gun, the electron gun? Should I say that every electron has a quantum state? Is it a plane wave, e to the i, k, x? But from electron to electron, the energy changes and the distribution of these energies is classical. So let's say I have a Gaussian distribution of, of energy. So there comes out one electron in a pure quantum state with that energy. Then another one comes out, no relation with the first one that has, is in a pure quantum state, but with another energy. Or you might say, no, every electron is a wave packet. So it is the combination of many energies that are superposed quant in a quantum way now. In the same way, like we build up wave packets in quantum mechanics, but made, putting many momentum states together. And so which one better models the electron? And the mere answer is that the question is meaningless because when you compute the density matrix, assuming one or the other approach, you just get the same result. So just don't, you don't need to see any of the details, but just figure out that the final formulas for the density operator are just the same. So the argument of Ballantyne eventually means that there is, you're losing your time trying to figure out whether this is a set of electrons that acts like this or a set of electrons like, like that. All you need to know, all you can have access to is this, question, this uh, quantity here. Okay, I'm essentially done. Uh, just to mention here, many years ago, I tried myself to demonstrate that there would, could probably be a way to distinguish these two collections by measuring arrival times. 
So that in the Bohmian way, in the Bohmian interpretation. And uh, the answer actually is negative. You cannot do it even with arrival times. There is no way you can, let's say, beat the indistinguishability theorem. And it's very interesting that uh, Sorkin, a very well-known physicist, uh, was, we were discussing in a table in a conference and he wrote in a little piece of paper a couple of formulas and told me look for, a, for an operator, Hermitian operator, in terms of which you can, you can represent the current and this operator actually exists. So the proof that you cannot do it even with Bohmian mechanics, even with arrival times, is just, is in the end is a, is a three lines. Three lines demonstration after you know what to do. Okay, conclusions. The information approach starts, as we said, with a completely operational definition of what the physical magnitudes are. So, no meaning deeper than what the measuring devices give you. And this re renders exactly pointless the discussion of the meaning and the values that we assign to observables are just the labels of our own devices. And the laws of physics in the information approach are certainly in that sense epistemic. They speak about the information which we have, which is quantified in terms of probabilities. This is the difference between the information and the statistical interpretation of quantum mechanics. So now here, we still have the same objects, we have density matrices and so on, but the information with the, the, let's say, interpretation we give to that is that these density matrices quantify the way that evolves in space and time, the information that we have in the physical world. And the laws of physics are, of course, statistical in that sense, and the fundamental quantities we said is the density matrix. And there is nothing in particular Nothing particular between pure states and mixed states. And maybe the whole universe from the start is in a certain reality to which, as we said, we have no access. But our own construction only allows to measure this part of the world, only gives us partial information about the universe, which is in the form of a mixed state. I mean, we could live in a universe in which there is no universal wave function as some people were trying to build in the 80s. There's no universal wave function. The universe is in a mixed state from the start, maybe. Okay, final remark. We've done a long way going just to this ontology and a lot of philosophy or philosophicos maidanos, who was named by Nicholas. Is it does it make sense? Is, there, is it a useful thing which we did today? I mean, to study ontology. I mean, there is a contradiction, definitely, if you are... I mean, before anything else, science, I will, I will just quote Chandra Sekhar here, that science, the, the, the first task of the scientist is to classif classification. I mean, you see the physical world, you see it's a very humble definition of what you're supposed to do. You see phenomena around you. There are planets and flowers and the sky and I don't know what else. And you try to put them into some classification scheme at the beginning. You have to say what of them are like, which of them are different and how many different concepts you need to describe them all. So you start with that and that leads to interpretational schemes or what I like to call pictures and whether or not these pictures reflect in any objective way the physical reality if you believe in that is a question that is actually outside the framework of the discussion of the scientific method itself so it's not the, the business of a physicist to tell you whether these pictures do map physical reality or not. So if you like, the epistemic approach to science is nearly by definition correct. I mean, it's very hard to beat because for sure, what we always do is to process the information that passes in front of our eyes. And if not to mention anything else, 
when we speak about the quantum world, in the end, we speak about pointers and pointers are macroscopic. I mean, we do not see the electron. We do not see the proton. We do not see even galaxies. I mean, all we do is we bring the very small and the very big to the scale of the human eye, to the scale of the human being. That's all what physics does. And so in that sense, you could say that there is probably nearly by definition, physics is epistemic. However, the ontological question is useful. It has motivated and will probably continue to motivate some of the greatest progresses in science. It will lead to useful results and probably it is behind the most major scientific and technological, uh, let's say, events, uh, achievements that have ever happened. So I finish that with the word of Feynman. And Feynman said about pictures, this is from his Nobel talk. I don't know why this is, let's say the fact that you can speak about many different pictures about the same thing. It remains a mystery, but I, I, it was something I learned from experience. There is always another way to say the same thing that doesn't look at all like the way you said it before. I don't know what the reason is for this. I think it is somehow a representation of the simplicity of nature. So the fact that you can speak about many different ways about this elusive physical reality, actually, after all, is an indication of the simplicity of nature. And I think I will stop with that quote. And so thank you. Many thanks for the very, very nice talk, Christos. Let me try now to project the because if they don't, we don't see them, maybe they don't exist. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so here you are, and we see raised hands. And uh, first of all, let us, we do every time, uh, is anyone here in the audience who wants to ask something since Professor left? And then we start with the uh, first, Janis. Okay. Okay, uh, Christos, thank you very much. Just a comment. I, I, I agree with everything you said in, in, in this last uh, slide, especially that science is epistemic. We can only uh, learn what we can learn about nature, uh, but, uh, and there is no ontology. I agree with that. There is no, uh, uh, no ontology. However, the, the last uh, line that you wrote in the previous uh, slide was that looking for ontology helps us. And I, I, I want to say that having different ways of seeing the same thing help. And even though sometimes we call, we call about a deeper, we say about a deeper level of understanding. If you don't agree with the term deeper, let's say an alternative way of say, saying the same thing. Mm -hmm. So uh, to, to, to close my comment is our theory we do not challenge quantum mechanics, but we have an alternative way of reproducing the same things, at least for free particles. We now can do it for free particles very well. And it's an alternative. I, I think it's a deeper level. And whenever you, you go to a deeper level or even an alternative level, you may see things that you didn't see from your previous approach. And we are seeing it some certain things that we have discussed before. So I agree completely that there's no point to say that I have reached the ontology of, of things that will we will nobody will ever do that. But looking for that, I think it helps science. Uh, I agree absolutely, of course. And I have to add a comment to the comment of Yanis. And this is something that I typically say in conferences to the, my Bohemian friends, because you know, when you go to these conferences, the people fight really on the preference to one or the other ontology. I mean, there are sometimes there are even polls among physicists. Do you prefer the parallel universe, let's say, parallel histories thing, or you prefer the, I don't know, the, the Bohemian approach and so on. I would say, if we all accept the fact that these are pictures of reality, then essentially we are done with the conversation of today. But there is a bit more on that because maybe I can construct yet another and yet another picture. So now the question is, is there 
what's the real gain out of that? And what I always say, this I say also very, very emphatically to the Bohemian people, a picture is not there just to speak in another way about reality, but essentially to help us describe more efficiently certain aspects of this reality that would otherwise be quite difficult to, to discover. For example, try to make particle physics without Feynman diagrams. You may not believe in, in the paths of particles. You may not believe that there are paths for fields. None of that. I mean, why, is, why should I believe in any of this, let's say, on, on, the, on the ontological level? But yet, if I try to make the calculations, if I try to discover a new phenomena, if I try to propose new things to look for, okay, then there are clear aspects. If you want to do chemistry, you do it a la Schrodinger. And if you want to do particle physics, scatterings, I mean, you do it with Feynman, in, uh, let's say, path integrals. And so the answer is always the same. Whenever you come with a new proposal, your, let's say, mission does not end when you are able to demonstrate that that proposal was equivalent to something else. You might be quite ambitious and say, but you know, there is an aspect that might actually look different. That's, of course, that's something else because then you propose a way to falsify the theory. But even if we accept that there is no or to falsification expand it, or, to falsify or, or to expand it, exactly. But even we accept that this will not be the case, there is still ground for new pictures and new ideas, provided that these ones help us to move on, discovering new phenomena, analyzing in an easier way the, the existing phenomena, producing technology. This is the role, let's say, of, of that business. Okay, then let's uh, move on to... Hi. Could I speak? Uh, Professor uh, Floratos, right? Uh, yes, yes. Okay. Yes. Please go, go on with your question, then come to, we will come to Dimos. Okay. Um, Christos, thank you very much for your inspiring lecture. Uh, I would like to, uh, to complement somehow um, uh, about uh, uh, the role of the of uh, science and quantum mechanics and uh, the development of quantum field theories is not only classifying statistical properties of nature, nature but is, uh, it has huge predictive power. <clears throat> so you, the reality is related and the objective reality, if it exists or not, is related that if you can predict something you don't know. So if after five years I prepare an experiment and I look for phenomena, which I don't know uh, before how to describe, and I have a theory that uh, tells me how to describe it. If the experiment gives me positive answer, so my theory is correct, then I need more experiment, etc. But the objective reality somehow is supported by the predictive power of the theory. Absolutely. If, if we did not have prediction, then it would be only a classification like a zoology, okay? Just classifying what animals exist in nature, etc. So science is not like that, okay? It's predictive. So the Absolutely. reality is the predictive power of science. Okay? By the way, this is one of the weaknesses I claim always of the Bohmian, let's say, <laughs> group. Let's say, I am not aware of any major prediction of a scientific phenomenon that came out of Bohmian theory. I mean, you always get tons of paper telling you, oh, if you, you know, if you do this and if you do that, you can produce the trajectories and look how easy and everything looks very nice and the two slit experiment and the surface, uh, atom surface scattering and all of that. But tell me something I don't know, tell me a new phenomenon. <laughs> Maybe the best option, I, I have probably one exception to that, it uh, works by people like uh, Pinto Neto or uh, maybe uh, Patrick uh, Peter in France mm -hmm. that tell you, okay, if you go to the very early universe and you don't know how to do quantum mechanics there, uh, you can probably find the Bohmian way to describe what happened to the scale factor close to the Planck era and so on and so forth. Well, 
I don't know how much of a prediction this is, but at least there is something. I mean, you can say I can have a theory maybe that allows me to build a cosmological model that maybe later, but this, what you said before, I emphasize is absolutely correct. You have a new method. Tell me something I don't know. Tell, and that will make everybody believe that you do something useful. Mm -hmm. To stress, the, to stress the connection of predictability and the objective exactly. reality, I would take an example from classical physics. With the laws of Newton, we can predict uh, the, where the moon, when we don't observe it, after one year, uh, three months, two days, one hour, one minute, and ten picoseconds will be. And then we go there and we measure and the moon is there. Okay, this is this is objective reality. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I, I agree. Okay. Thank you then, uh, Dimos. Okay. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, let me interject here my own uh, two cents. Uh, well, I agree fully with my knowledge here that Yes, we predict, and that essentially implies that we sort of understand there is an underlying reality which we have some access to, maybe not 100% access for a reason I will explain. But not only that, but we can find things we don't know about. <laughs> That's the important thing. So there are things that we don't know about, and yet we find them when we sharpen our uh, instruments, for example. So anyway, that's the point. So at a, uh, at a danger of being uh, uh, hubristic or maybe overly simplistic, I, uh, I would like to simply, after, I, I don't work in this field, but of course, like any scientist uh, has been wondering about all these issues. And we discussed that in the past, uh, Christo. Uh, uh, as you said, information, uh, it's my conviction, though I don't know the, uh, how to handle with the formalism, I'll be more than happy to, uh, 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 enlist your help there. Uh, it's uh, effectively what we do in physics. Uh, oh no, we do in physics. Nature itself has limits of information. Well, for example, I don't know right now if Mars exists or not. Why? Because there's a speed of information uh, propagation. I have to wait, uh, what is, 10 minutes or something to realize if Mars has not exploded. So, but we don't seem to worry about that. That's another limit in our perception of nature. That's encapsulated by the Lorentz transform mathematically. Why? Because nature sets a limit to how fast you can set information. The same thing is with quantum mechanics. Nature tells you that you cannot squeeze information more than h bar. And therefore, and this is encapsulated by Fourier transform. Once I knew that, then any mystery of quantum mechanics has gone away from me. I'm not, I don't find any mystery in quantum mechanics because that's exactly a, a limit that's put by nature the same way it's put for the speed of propagation of light. One is, I call it information density, the other one information speed. So once you have that, my question here is, what is a classical object? That's my big question. Here, not the quantum objects. I have no problem with quantum objects. Well, My understanding here is the following: that we get to these paradoxes because we we query nature. Nature is trying to answer us in this <laughs> within limitation, but we try to interpret it the measurements we make as ignoring that particular restriction. So here is an example. Astronomy, you mentioned astronomy. We have the star Sirius. The Sirius sends photons here. I don't believe that Sirius, <laughs> yes, Sirius is there even when I don't look at that. So here is the, I'm here sitting on the earth and measure photons from Sirius. How big are these photons? Most people okay. are asked, they say, is the wavelength of the photon? No, these photons are many meters wide, many meters wide, why? Because the only thing I know here, I have an object whose size I don't know, but this knowledge of my object is subject by the certain principle. And therefore, the, each photon has a transverse momentum, which is equal to the size of the, to h bar divided by the size of the photon. So therefore, there's a small angle, delta p, 
of that uncertainty in transverse momentum over P, the momentum of the photon. Multiply that by the distance, and you know how big the photon is. And you can test that. This is tested through the uh, 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 Hamburg and Brown twist interferometer, where you basically have two detectors that correlate photons, and then the, uh, the distance becomes larger than the size of the photon, the correlation goes away. You can do that with frequency, of course, and phase. <laughs> and that's what, infer that's what they, our interferometers do. So why is that su surprising? Well, I mean, this is phase conservation. I told that to an experiment, observer friend of mine, and he understood it immediately. He, he knows that phase is solid angle times energy, he said, and immediately he understood that the photon, when it arrives here, has to be many, many meters wide. So what, what, where is the problem? The problem is that we think of a photon as being emitted by an atom. No, we have a, some source of photons. The only thing we know is a source of photons and we query now the size of these photons. That's all there is to it. The same is true also with the uh, uh, EPR experiment. We have two yeah. electrons or we have two photons. We never had two photons. We had a system of zero momentum and zero angular momentum because it was probably a transition from uh, uh, a forbidden transition, delta L equals zero. And now from previous experience, we know that we can measure individual photons if we put a detector. Well, the system has zero momentum and zero angular momentum. So therefore you have a system that propagates. <laughs> it has to propagate to, pre to preserve the, the wave function has to propagate to, to preserve the uh, uh, momentum. And therefore you make a measurement in one size and one side. Of course, then it Im immediately correlates the whole L equals zero, P equals zero system. So if you make another measurement, you find something that is related to that. No information, of course, is transferred, according to Einstein. Can so I make a comment on all? Yes, of please, go ahead. Actually, you posed many issues here, but I will start with the last one. Well, you posed, you said, you posed two obvious limits, which is the speed of light, and yes. NH bar, NH bar, yes. And then you said, well, if I consider those two limits, then in the end, there is no mystery. But that's, I don't think this is exactly the issue of what, what I, at least of what I was trying to say today, because there is a third limit. And this limit is the scale of the observer who makes the experiments. Well, let me try to motivate that. Sure. And I will not start with the, with the size of the photon because that's a bit misleading. I will try with the last comment which you made. What does it mean to measure individual photons? Well, that brings us, for example, to what is, let's say, if I am to accept in physics, in all of physics, that there is one fundamental observable, one, one magnitude for everything, what would that one be? Well, quantum field theory will tell you numbers. Yes, okay, sure. everything is numbers we and the fundamental exactly. operators yes. are the yes. number operators. Yes. Okay. So whenever you say, I measure, think of that. Whenever you say, I measure a single photon in an entangled system or not, or whatever no, it might be. I don't know what it is, you see. I have a exactly. No, no, but, but let me finish the sentence. Yeah. Then all you claim here, is that there is a fundamental quantity called number, okay, whose eigenvalues are one, yes. two, three, four, and the operator is just a dagger times a, where this is the, the field, let's say, okay? So now, if I accept that, I have to say, why number? And then if you ask me, ask that question to yourself, why number? And my own answer is because when I was a kid, I started counting with natural numbers. There is nothing more than that. There is, I mean, nature will not distinguish the electrons of a table from the electrons of a chair, will not distinguish the molecules of the air with the molecules of the door. And if you know, Mermin has wrote in some other article, he said, if you really believe because according, let's say, to quantum field theory, all the electrons of the universe are just instants, let's say, excitations of the one and unique fermionic field that permeates the whole universe. 
And Merman once wrote that if you really believe that this is true, if you really believe that all the electrons in your skin are just excitations of the one and unique fermionic field which permeates the universe, then you have some elements of insanity in your thought. <laughs> so what we try to say yeah. here is that it's not about what are the restrictions put by nature itself, but what are the restrictions put by the way that we are the ones doing physics. And if I put it in your words, I would say the most fundamental of that is the fact that we, that since children, to begin with, we learn to count. Yes. Okay, I can transfer that to anything else which you said. Let's say the, the diameter you say of the atom, it's one right, but I never see one. Of course, of course you don't, but then there you go. I you, don't you see it. I, I multiply it. I, I have electron microscopy and I can see the wave function. I don't see the wave function. I see a picture in my computer. The picture is three times three, let's say, centimeter long. There is a world, a whole world interfering between the thing which I claim to describe and myself. It is that limit which generates all the troubles we are now speaking about. I personally don't see any trouble. <laughs> I don't see any trouble. You have conserved quantities and we have measurements. And yes, the electrons, yeah, there may be excitations of an electronic field, of course, but there are conserved numbers of electrons. So uh, uh, there's charge conservation. Now, unless, of course, we're wrong about charge conservation, but to a high accuracy, and of course, that's here's the epistemic aspect of things, because we only know what we've, uh, uh, all the knowledge we accumulate through experiments. So we believe now, with proof, though, that there is, with highly accurate proof, that there is a conservation uh, of charge, and therefore, there are, <laughs> they, individual particles we call electrons, they conserve their charges through the experiments we make. So I don't, that's very nice. Uh, the, uh, the way you describe the, statistic, the different statistical outcomes from, it was very nice. So it basically tells you that you should believe what you measure. You should not really sit down and try to split hair and wondering whether uh, something that happened at the other end of the universe then affects you here and then you, you totally, uh, uh, you don't know anything about. No, the ontology is there, and uh, we just cannot uh, observe the ontology. We observe the we we epistemologically uh, test the ontology for a certain. Uh, now, is there are there some limits in which we don't understand? Uh, this may go wrong. It might be at the level of quantum gravity. I do not know. But uh, again, the issue of the. <laughs> of the measurement de uh, device, that's of course a very important one because I, that's the thing I don't understand, I said. I don't understand all of a sudden what is a classical, uh, what's classical physics. So in all the mystery now is left at, me, at least in me in quantum mechanics is what is exactly the measurement? Yeah. And again, at the uh, level of being a hubristic, I'll just simply say that measurement is the entanglement of the particle with the detector. And the question of, of course, the difference is that the detector has an action, which is many, 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 many values of H bar, while the particle has only one. And therefore the detector, because of this huge number of H bar that involves, uh, behaves as a object. Again, depends on what uh, question you ask about the detector, uh, which has definite position and definite momentum and then you interact with the particle. My guess is that the interaction changes also the detector because entanglement also brings the two together, the two wave functions, but the wave function of the detector is so well-defined being its position momentum. So we don't worry about it. We only worry about the measurement of the, uh, of the wave function of the electron, which of course achieves one of its uh, uh, states that you have, and that gives a pointer to a particular uh, position. That's, that's basically it. Uh, and to go now, if I may take a minute to go back to the issue of the Schrodinger's cat, we can repeat to say, it has to do with what we know about it and how do we go about it. So 
we have now, we can repeat the same for the, with electrons. If the spin is up, the cat, the cat is uh, awake. If the spin is down, the spin is down, the cat is, uh, uh, is asleep. We don't want to kill the cat. So we do the experiment and we haven't opened the box. That doesn't mean that the, uh, the uh, uh, cat is in superposition. No, of course not. All the issue of whether it's asleep or awake, it happens at the measurement. That's when that's what defines the, whether the fact is asleep or not. The fact I haven't opened the box is totally irrelevant. As I mentioned to Yanis, it's like I have the, uh, uh, the game uh, of uh, Bartz and, uh, and Real, uh, Real, and I haven't looked at the uh, result. Does that mean they, they haven't been decided yet what happened? No, the game has finished, the result is well known. The same with the cat. It, the whole thing happened at the detector, at the detection of the spin of the electron. I can use the uh, experiment you said, the stern gerlach experiment. I separate the uh, up to the down spin, and I let only the up spin interact. I don't have any worry about that now. I know the cat is asleep because the up is asleep. So it has nothing. So here is the resolution of the uh, cat experiment. We have a problem with that because, of course, the issue is ontological, uh, epistemological, as you said, and therefore we have to know what happened to the cat. Well, whatever was to happen to the cat, it happened to the cat, it's in there. It doesn't need me to know. It's only I know what has happened to the cat, and that's the epistemological aspect of the, of the, okay. of the problem. Uh, well, this takes us very long, and probably we should somehow conclude. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. But anyway, it was okay. great to hear you talk okay. and see you again. Okay, let, let's check if there is someone else who wants to ask something. I don't see any raised hands, so maybe we conclude here. Let's go back there. Okay, then uh, let's thank Chris again. And, uh, we will meet again next uh, Monday. You will get an announcement on Tuesday for next week. Okay. We'll gonna be notified so thank you thank you thank you very much very for much the